Honor Among Sportsmen by Richard Connell each with his favorite hunting pig on a stout string. A band of the leading citizens of Montpin moved in dignified procession down the Rue Victor Hugo in the direction of the hunting preserve. It was a mild, delicious Sunday, cool and tranquil as a pool in a woodland glade. To Perigord alone come such days. Peace was in the air, and the murmur of voices of men, intent on a mission of moment. The men of Montpont were going forth to hunt truffles. As Briat Severin points out in his Physiology of Taste, all France is inordinately truffoliferous, and the province of Perigord particularly so. On weekdays, the hunting of that succulent subterranean fungus was a business, indeed a vast commercial enterprise for were there not thousands of perigord pies to be made and uncounted tins of pate de foie gras to be given the last exquisite touch by the addition of a bit of truffle but on sunday it became a sport the chief the only sport of the citizens of montpont a preserve rich in beech oak and chestnut trees in whose shade the shy truffle thrives had been set apart and here the truffle was never hunted for mercenary motives but for sport and sport alone on weekdays truffle hunting was confined to professionals on sunday after church all montpont hunted truffles even the sub-prefect maintained a stable of notable pigs for the purpose for the pig is as necessary to truffle hunting as the beagle is to beagling a pig by dint of patient training can be taught to scent the buried truffle with his sensitive snout and to point to its hiding place as immobile as a cast-iron setter on a profiteer's lawn until its proud owner exhumes the prize an experienced pointing pig with a creditable record brings an enormous price in the markets of montpont at the head of the procession that kindly sunday marched m bonticue and m pantin with the decisive but leisurely tread of men of affairs they spoke to each other with an elaborate ceremonial politeness, for on this day at least they were rivals. On other days they were bosom friends. Today was the last of the fall hunting season, and they were tied with a score of some two hundred truffles each for the championship of Montpont an honor beside which winning the derby is nothing and the grand prix de rome a mere bauble in the eyes of all perigord to-day was to tell whether the laurels would rest on the round pink brow of m bonticue or the oval olive brow of m pantin m bonticue was the leading undertaker of montpont and in his stately appearance he satisfied the traditions of his calling he was a large man of forty or so and in his special hunting suit of jade-hued cloth he looked from a distance to be an enormous green pepper his face was vast and many-chinned and his eyes had been set at the bottom of wells sunk deep in his pink face it was said that even on a bright noon he could see the stars, as ordinary folk can by peering up from the bottom of a mine-shaft. They were small and cunning, his eyes, and a little diffident. In Montpont he was popular. Even had his heart not been as large as it undoubtedly was, his prowess as a hunter of truffles, and his complete devotion to that art— he insisted it was an art, would have endeared him to all right-thinking Montpontians. He was a bachelor, and said more than once, as he sipped his old Anjou in the Café de l'Univers, I marry, Bontecue marry, that is a cause of laughter, my friends. I have my little house, a good cook, and my Anastasie. 
What more could mortal ask? Certainly not an Eve in his paradise. I marry? I be dad to a collection of squealing, wiggling cabbages? I laugh at the idea. Anastasi was his pig, a prodigy at detecting truffles, and his most priceless treasure. He once said at a truffle hunter's dinner, I have but two passions, my comrades, the pursuit of the truffle and the flight from the female. M. Pantin had applauded this sentiment heartily. He, too, was a bachelor. He combined lucratively the offices of town veterinarian and apothecary, and had written an authoritative book, The Science of Truffle Hunting. To him it was a science, the first of sciences. He was a fierce-looking little man, with bellicose eyes and bristling mustachio, and quick nervous hands that always seemed to be rolling endless thousands of pills. He was given to fits of temper, but that is rather expected of a man in the south of France. His devotion to his pig, Clotilde, atoned in the eyes of Montpont for a slightly irascible nature. The party by now had reached the hunting preserve, and with eager, serious faces they lengthened the leashes on their pigs and urged them to their task. By the laws of the chase, the choicest area had been left for M. Bonticou and M. Pantin, and excited galleries followed each of the two leading contestants. Bets were freely made. In a scant nine minutes by the watch, Anastasi was seen to freeze and point. M. Bonticou plunged to his plump knees, whipped out his trowel, dug like a badger, and in another minute brought to light a handsome truffle, the size of a small potato, blackish-gray as the best truffles are, and studded with warts. With a gesture of triumph, he exhibited it to the umpire and popped it into his bag. He rewarded Anastasi with a bit of cheese and urged her to new conquests. But a few seconds later, Monsieur Pantin gave a short hop, skip and jump, and all eyes were fastened on Clotilde, who had grown motionless save for the tip of her snout, which quivered gently. M. Pantin dug feverishly and soon brandished aloft a well-developed truffle. So the battle waged. At one time, by a series of successes, M. Bonticou was three up on his rival, but Clotilde, by a bit of brilliant work beneath a chestnut tree, brought to light a nest of four truffles and sent the Pantin colors to the van. The sun was setting, time was nearly up. The other hunters had long since stopped and were clustered about the two chief contestants, who, pale but collected, bent all their skill to the hunt. Practically every square inch of ground had been covered. But one propitious spot remained, the shadow of a giant oak, and, moved by a common impulse, the stout Bonticou and the slender Pantin simultaneously directed their pigs toward it. But a little minute of time now remained. The gallery held its breath. Then a great shout made the leaves shake and rustle. Like two perfectly synchronized machines, Anastasi and Clotilde had frozen and were pointing. They were pointing to the same spot. M. Pantin, more active than his rival, had darted to his knees, his trowel poised for action. But a large hand was laid on his shoulder politely, and the silky voice of M. Bonticu said, "'If Monsieur will pardon me, may I have the honour of informing him that this is my find?' M. Pantin, trowel in mid-air, bowed as best a kneeling man can. "'I trust,' he said coolly, "'that Monsieur will not consider it an impertinence "'if I continue to dig up what my Clotilde has, "'beyond peradventure, discovered. "'And I hope Monsieur will not take it amiss "'if I suggest that he step out of the light.' 
as his shadow is not exactly that of a sapling. Monsieur Bontecue was trembling, but controlled. With profoundest respect, he said, from deep in his chest, I beg to be allowed to inform monsieur that he is, if I may say so, in error. I must ask monsieur, as a sportsman, to step back and permit me to take what is justly mine. Monsieur Pantin's face was terrible to see, but his voice was icily formal. I regret, he said, that I cannot admit monsieur's contention. In the name of sport and his own honor, I call upon monsieur to retire from his position. That, said monsieur Bontecue, I will never do. They both turned faces of appeal to the umpire. That official was bewildered. It is not in the rules, monsieur, he got out confusedly. In my forty years as an umpire, such a thing has not happened. It is a matter to be settled between you personally. As he said the words, Monsieur Pantin commenced to dig furiously. Monsieur Bontecue dropped to his knees and also dug, like some great green panic-stricken beaver. Mounds of dirt flew up. At the same second they spied the truffle, a monster of its tribe. At the same second, the plump fingers of M. Bontecue and the thin fingers of M. Pantin closed on it. Cries of dismay rose from the gallery. "'It is the largest of truffles,' called voices. "'Don't break it. Broken ones don't count.' But it was too late. M. Bontecue tugged violently, as violently tugged M. Pantin. The truffle, indeed a giant of its species, burst asunder. The two men stood, each with his half, each glaring. "'I trust,' said M. Bontecue, in his hollowest death-room voice, "'that monsieur is satisfied. I have my opinion of monsieur as a sportsman, a gentleman, and a Frenchman.' "'For my part,' returned M. Pantin with rising passion. It is impossible for me to consider Monsieur as any of the three. "'What's that you say?' cried M. Bontecue, his big face suddenly flamingly red. Monsieur, in addition to the defects in his sense of honour, is not also deficient in his sense of hearing,' returned the smouldering Pantin. "'Monsieur is insulting. That is his hope.' M. Bontecue was aflame with a great seething wrath, but he had sufficient control of his sense of insult to jerk at the leash of Anastasie and say, in a tone all Mampon could hear, "'Come, Anastasie, I once did M. Pantin the honour of considering him your equal. I must revise my estimate. He is not your sort of pig at all.' M. Pantin's eyes were blazing dangerously, but he retained a slipping grip on his emotions long enough to say, "'Come, Clotilde, do not demean yourself by breathing the same air as Monsieur and Madame Bontecue.' The eyes of M. Bontecue, ordinarily so peaceful, now shot forth sparks. Turning a livid face to his antagonist, he cried aloud, Monsieur Pantin, in my opinion, you are a puff-ball. This was too much, for to call a truffle-hunter a puff-ball is to call him a thing unspeakably vile. In the eyes of a true lover of truffles, a puff-ball is a noisome, obscene thing. It is a false truffle. In truffledom it is a fighting word. With a scream of rage, M. Pantin advanced on the bulky Bontecue. By the thumbs of saint Front he cried, You shall pay for that, M. Aristide Gontran, Louis Bontecue. Here and now, before all Montpont, before all Perigon, before all France, I challenge you to a duel to the death. Words rattled and jostled in his throat, so great was his anger. M. Bontecue stood motionless. His full moon face had gone white. The half of truffle slipped from his fingers. 
for he knew, as they all knew, that the dueling code of Perigord is inexorable. It is seldom nowadays that the Perigordians, even in their hottest moments, say the fighting word, for once a challenge has passed, retirement is impossible, and a duel is a most serious matter. By rigid rule, the challenger and challenged must meet at daybreak in mortal combat. At twenty paces they must each discharge two horse pistols. Then they must close on each other with sabres. Should these fail to settle the issue, each man is provided with a poniard for the most intimate stages of the combat. Such duels are seldom bloodless. Monsieur Montague's lips formed some syllables. They were, "'You are aware of the consequences of your words, Monsieur Pantin.' Perfectly. You do not wish to withdraw them? M. Bontecue, despite himself, injected a hopeful note into his query. I withdraw? Never in this life. On the contrary, not only do I not withdraw, I reiterate, bridled M. Pantin. In a requiescat in passe voice, M. Bontecue said, So be it. You have sealed your own doom, monsieur. I shall prepare to attend you first in the capacity of an opponent, and shortly thereafter in my professional capacity. Monsieur Pantin sneered openly. Monsieur the undertaker had better consider in his remaining hours whether it is feasible to embalm himself or have a stranger do it. With this thunderbolt of defiance, the little man turned on his heel and stumped from the field. M. Bontecue followed at last, but he walked as one whose knees have turned to marin glacé. He went slowly to his little shop and sat down among the coffins. For the first time in his life their presence made him uneasy. A big new one had just come from the factory. For a long time he gazed at it. Then he surveyed his own full-blown physique with a measuring eye. He shuddered. The light fell on the silver plate on the lid, and his eyes seemed to see engraved there. Monsieur Aristide Gontran, Louis Bontecue, died in the forty-first year of his life on the field of honour. He was, without peer, as a hunter of truffles, may he rest in peace. With almost a smile, he reflected that this inscription would make Monsieur Pantin very angry. Yes, he would insist on it. He looked down at his fat fists and sighed profoundly and shook his big head. They had never pulled a trigger or gripped a sword hilt. The knife, the peaceful table knife, the fork, and the leash of Anastasi, those had occupied them. Anastasi. A globular tear rose slowly from the wells in which his eyes were set, and unchecked wandered gently down the folds of his face. Who would care for Anastasi? With another sigh that seemed to start in the caverns of his soul, he reached out and took a dusty book from a case and bent over it. It contained the time-honored dueling code of ancient Perigord. Suddenly, as he read, his eyes brightened and he ceased to sigh. He snapped the book shut, took from a peg his best hat, dusted it with his elbow, and stepped out into the starry Perigord night. At high noon, three days later, as duly decreed by the dueling coat, Monsieur Pantin, in full evening dress, appeared at the shop of Monsieur Bontecue, accompanied by two solemn-visaged seconds, to make final arrangements for the affair of honour. They found Monsieur Bontecue sitting comfortably among his coffins, he greeted them with a serene smile. Monsieur Pantin frowned portentously. "'We have come,' announced the chief second, Monsieur Dufon, the town butcher, "'as the representatives of this grossly insulted gentleman to demand satisfaction. The weapons and conditions are, of course, fixed by the code. It remains only to set the date.' Would Friday at dawn in the truffle preserve be entirely convenient for Monsieur? Monsieur Bontecue's shrug contained more regret than a hundred words could convey. Alas, it will be impossible, Monsieur, he said with a deep bow. 
Impossible? But yes, I assure monsieur that nothing would give me more exquisite pleasure than to grant this gentleman, he stressed this word, the satisfaction that his honor, he also stressed this word, appears to demand. However, it is impossible. The seconds and Monsieur Pantin looked at Monsieur Montague and at each other. "'But this is monstrous!' exclaimed the chief second. "'Is it that Monsieur refuses to fight?' Monsieur Montague's slowly shaken head indicated most poignant regret. "'But no, Monsieur,' he said, "'I do not refuse. Is it not a question of honour? Am I not a sportsman? But, alas, I am forbidden to fight.' forbidden alas yes but why because said m bontecu i am a married man the eyes of the three men widened they appeared stunned by surprise m pantin spoke first you married he demanded but certainly when only yesterday to whom i demand proof to madame obisson of barbaste the widow of sergeant obisson the same i do not believe it declared m pantin m bontecue smiled raised his voice and called angelique angelique my dove will you come here a little moment what and leave the lentil soup to burn came an undoubtedly feminine voice from the depths of the house yes my treasure "'What a pest you are, Aristide,' said the voice, and its owner, an ample woman of perhaps thirty, appeared in the doorway. Monsieur Bontecue waved a fat hand toward her. "'My wife, monsieur,' he said. She bowed stiffly. The three men bowed. They said nothing. They gaped at her. She spoke to her husband. "'Is it that you take me for a punch and judy show, Aristide?' "'Ah, never, my rosebud!' cried m bontecue with a placating smile you see my own these gentlemen wished there she interrupted the lentil soup it burns she hurried back to the kitchen the three men m pantin and his seconds consulted together beyond question said m dufon m bontecue cannot accept the challenge he is married you are not the code says plainly opponents must be on terms of absolute equality and family responsibility thus a single man cannot fight a married one and so forth see here it is in black and white m pantin was boiling as he faced the calm bontecue to think stormed the little man that truffles may be hunted yes even eaten by such a man i see through you monsieur but think not that a pantin can be flouted. I have my opinion of you, Monsieur the Undertaker. Monsieur Bontecue shrugged. Your opinions do not interest me, he said, and only my devotion to the cause of free speech makes me concede that you are entitled to an opinion at all. Good morning, Monsieur. Good morning. He bowed them down a lane of caskets and out into the afternoon sunshine. The face of M. Pantin was black. Time went by in Perigord. Other truffle-hunting seasons came and went, but M. Bontecu and Pantin entered no more competitions. They hunted, of course, the one with Anastasie, the other with Clotilde, but they hunted in solitary state and studiously avoided each other. Then one day, M. Pantin's hairy countenance, stern and determined, appeared like a genie at the door of M. Bontecu's shop. The rivals exchanged profound bows. "'I have the honor," said M. Pantin, in his most formal manner, "'to announce to Monsieur that the impediment to our meeting on the field of honor has been at last removed.' and that i am now in a position to send my seconds to him to arrange that meeting may they call to-morrow at high noon i do not understand said m bontecue arching his eyebrows i am still married i too said m pantin with a grim smile am married you pantin monsieur jess 
"'If monsieur will look in the newspaper of to-day,' said monsieur Pantin dryly, "'he will see an announcement of my marriage yesterday to madame Marcelet of Perjoux. There was astonishment and alarm in the face of the undertaker. Then reverie seemed to wrap him round. The scurrying of footsteps, the bumble of voices, in the rooms over the shop aroused him. His face was tranquil again as he spoke. "'Will monsieur and his seconds do me the honour of calling on me day after to-morrow?' he asked. "'As you wish,' replied monsieur Pantin, a gleam of satisfaction in his eye." Punctual to the second, Monsieur Pantin and his friends presented themselves at the shop of Monsieur Bontecue. His face, they observed, was first worried, then smiling, then worried again. "'Will to-morrow at dawn be convenient for Monsieur?' inquired the butcher Dufan. Monsieur Bontecue gestured regret with his shoulders and said, "'I am desolate with chagrin, Monsieur, believe me, but—' It is impossible. Impossible? It cannot be, cried Monsieur Pantin. Monsieur has one wife. I have one wife. Our responsibilities are equal. Is it that Monsieur is prepared to swallow his word of insult? Never, declared Monsieur Bontecue. I yearn to encounter Monsieur in mortal combat. But, alas, it is not I, but nature that intervenes. I have only this morning become a father, monsieur, as if in confirmation there came from the room above the treble wail of a new infant. Behold! exclaimed Monsieur Bonticue with a wave of his hand. Monsieur Pantin's face was purple. This is too much, he raged. But wait, monsieur, but wait. He clapped his high hat on his head and stamped out of the shop. Truffles were hunted, and the days flowed by, and Monsieur Pantin and his seconds one high noon again called upon Monsieur Bontecue, who greeted them urbanely, albeit he appeared to have lost weight, and tiny worry wrinkles were visible in his face. Monsieur, began the chief second, may I have the honor? I'll speak for myself, interrupted Monsieur Pantin. With my own voice I wish to inform Monsieur that nothing can now prevent our meeting at dawn to-morrow. To-day, Monsieur the Undertaker, I, too, became a father. The news seemed to interest, but not to stagger, Monsieur Bontecue. His smile was sad as he said, "'You are too late, Monsieur the Apothecary and Veterinarian. Two days ago I also became a father again.' Monsieur Pantin appeared to be about to burst, so terrible was his rage. "'But wait!' he screamed. "'But wait!' and he rushed out. Next day, Monsieur Pantin and his seconds returned. The mustachios of the little men were on end with excitement, and his eye was triumphant. "'We meet to-morrow at daybreak,' he announced." "'Ah, that it were possible,' sighed Monsieur Bontecue. "'But the code forbids. "'As I said yesterday, Monsieur has a wife and a child, "'while I have a wife and children. "'I regret our inequality, but I cannot deny it.' "'Spare your regrets, Monsieur,' rejoined the small man. "'I, too, have two children now.' "'You?' Monsieur Bontecue stared, puzzled. "'Yesterday you had but one.' "'It cannot be, monsieur.' "'It can be,' cried Monsieur Pantin. "'Yesterday I adopted one.' The peony face of Monsieur Bontecue did not blanch at this intelligence. Again he smiled with an infinite sadness. "'I appreciate,' he said, "'Monsieur Pantin's courtesy in affording me this opportunity, "'but, alas, he has not been in possession of the facts.' By an almost unpardonable oversight, I neglected to inform Monsieur that I had become the father not of one child, but of two. Twins, Monsieur, would you care to inspect them? Monsieur Pantin's face was contorted with a wrath shocking to witness. He bit his lip, he clenched his fist. The end is not yet, he shouted. No, no, Monsieur. By the thumbs of Saint-Front, I shall adopt another child. 
At high noon next day, three men in grave parade went down the Rue Victor Hugo and entered the shop of Monsieur Bonticue. Monsieur Pantin spoke. The adoption has been made, he announced. Here are the papers. I, too, have a wife and three children. Shall we meet at dawn tomorrow? Monsieur Bonticue looked up from his account books with a rueful smile. Ah, if it could be, he said, but it cannot be. It cannot be, echoed Monsieur Pantin. No, said Monsieur Bonticue sadly. Last night my aged father-in-law came to live with me. He is a new and weighty responsibility, Monsieur. Monsieur Pantin appeared numbed for a moment. Then, with a glare of concentrated fury, he rasped, I, too, have an aged father-in-law. He slammed the shop door after him. That night, when Monsieur Bonticue went to the immaculate little sty back of his shop to see if the pride of his heart Anastasie was comfortable, to chat with her a moment, and to present her with a morsel of truffle to keep up her interest in the chase, he found her lying on her side moaning faintly between moans she breathed with a laboured wheeze and in her gentle blue eyes stood the tears of suffering she looked up feebly piteously at monsieur bonticue with a cry of horror and alarm he bent over her anastasie my anastasie what is it what ails my brave one she grunted softly short stifled grunts of anguish he made a swift examination. Expert in all matters pertaining to the pig, he perceived that she had contracted an acute case of that rare and terrible disease known locally as Paragord Pip, and he knew only too well that her demise was but a question of hours. His Anastasie would never track down another truffle unless— He leaned weakly against the wall and clasped his warm brow— there was but one man in all the world who could cure her, and that man was Pantin, the veterinarian. His elixir Pantin, a secret specific, was the only known cure for the dread malady. Pride and love wrestled within the torn soul of the stricken Bonticue. To humble himself before his rival, it was unthinkable. He could see the sneer on Monsieur Pantin's olive face, he could hear his cutting words of refusal. The dew of conflicting emotions dampened the brow of Monsieur Bonticue. Anastasie whimpered in pain. He could not stand it. He struck his chest a resounding blow of decision. He reached for his hat. Monsieur Bonticue knocked timidly at the door of the apothecary veterinarian's house. A head appeared at a window. "'Who is it?' demanded a shrill, cross female voice. "'It is I, Bonticue. I wish to speak with Monsieur Pantin.' "'Nice time to come,' complained the lady. She shouted into the darkness of the room, "'Pantin, Pantin, you sleepy lout! Wake up! There's a great oaf of a man outside wanting to speak to you.' "'Patience, my dear Rosalie, patience,' came the voice of Monsieur Pantin. It was strangely meek. Presently the head of M. Pantin, all nightcap and mustachios, was protruded from the window. "'You have come to fight?' he asked. "'But no.' "'Bah! Then why wake me up in this cold night?' "'It is a family matter, monsieur,' said the shivering Bonticue, "'a matter the most pressing.' "'Is it that monsieur has adopted an orphanage?' inquired Pantin, "'or brought nine old aunts to live with him?' "'No, no, monsieur, it is most serious. It is Anastasie. She is dying. "'A thousand regrets, but I cannot act as Paul Bearer,' returned Monsieur Pantin, preparing to shut the window. "'Good night.' "'I beg, monsieur, to attend a little second,' cried Monsieur Bonticue. "'You can save her.' "'I save her?' Monsieur Pantin's tone suggested that the idea was deliciously absurd." "'Yes, yes, yes!' cried Bonticue, catching at a straw. "'You alone! She has the Paragord Pip, monsieur!' "'Ah, indeed! Yes, one cannot doubt it. Most amusing!' "'You are cruel, monsieur!' cried Bonticue. "'She suffers! Ah, how she suffers!' 
"'She will not suffer long,' said Pantin coldly. There was a sob in Bontecue's voice as he said, "'I entreat monsieur to save her. I entreat him as a sportsman.' In the window, Monsieur Pantin seemed to be thinking deeply. "'I entreat him as a doctor. The ethics of his profession demand—' "'You have used me abominably, monsieur,' came the voice of Pantin. "'But when you appeal to me as a sportsman and a doctor, I cannot refuse. Wait.' The window banged down, and in a second or so Monsieur Pantin, in hastily donned attire— joined his rival, and silently they walked through the night to the bedside of the dying Anastasie. Once there, Monsieur Pantin's manner became professional, intense, impersonal. Warm water, buckets of it, he ordered. Yes, monsieur. Olive oil and cotton. Yes, monsieur. With trembling hands, Monsieur Bontecue brought the things desired, and hovered about, speaking gently to Anastasie, calling her pet names, soothing her. The apothecary veterinarian was busy. He forced the contents of a huge black bottle down her throat. He anointed her with oil, water, and unknown substances. He ordered his rival about briskly. Rub her belly. Bontecue rubbed violently. Pull her tail. Bontecue pulled. Massage her limbs. Bontecue massaged till he was gasping for breath. The light began to come back to the eyes of Anastasie, the rose hue to her pale snout. She stopped whimpering. Monsieur Pantin rose with a smile. The crisis is past, he announced. She will live. What in the name of all the devils? This last ejaculation was blurred and smothered, for the overjoyed Bontecue, with the impulsiveness of his warm southern nature, had thrown his arms about the little man, and planted loud kisses on both hairy cheeks. They stood facing each other, oddly shy. "'If monsieur would do me the honor, began Monsieur Bontecue, a little thickly, "'I have some ancient port.' A glass or two after that walk in the cold would be good for monsieur, perhaps. If monsieur insists, murmured Pantin. Monsieur Bontecue vanished and reappeared with a cobwebbed bottle. They drank. Pantin smacked his lips. Timidly, monsieur Bontecue said, I can never sufficiently repay monsieur for his kindness. He glanced at Anastasie, who slept tranquilly. She is very dear to me. "'Do I not know?' replied M. Pantin. "'Have I not Clotilde? "'I trust she is in excellent health, monsieur. "'She was never better,' replied M. Pantin. "'He finished his glass, and it was promptly refilled. "'Only the sound of Anastasie's regular breathing could be heard. "'M. Pantin put down his glass. "'In a manner that tried to be casual, he remarked, I will not attempt to conceal from monsieur that his devotion to his Anastasie has touched me. Believe me, monsieur Bontecue, I am not unaware of the sacrifice you made in coming to me for her sake. Monsieur Bontecue, deeply moved, bowed. Monsieur would have done the same for his Clotilde, he said. Monsieur has demonstrated himself to be a thorough sportsman. I am grateful to him. I'd have missed Anastasie. But naturally, ah, yes, went on Monsieur Bontecue, when my wife scolds and the children scream, it is to her I go for a little talk. She never argues. Monsieur Pantin looked up from a long draught. Does your wife scold and your children scream? he asked. Alas, but too often, answered Monsieur Bontecue. You should hear my Rosalie, sighed Monsieur Pantin. I, too, seek consolation as you do. I talk with my Clotilde. Monsieur Bontecue nodded sympathetically. My wife is always nagging me for more money, he said, with a sudden burst of confidence. And the undertaking business, my dear Pantin, is not what it was. Do I not know, said Pantin, when folks are well, we both suffer. I stagger beneath my load, sighed Bontecue. My load is no less light, remarked Pantin. If my family responsibilities should increase, observed Bontecue, it would be little short of a calamity. If mine did, said Pantin, it would be a tragedy. 
And yet, mused Montague, our responsibilities seem to go on increasing. Alas, it is but too true. The statesmen are talking of limiting armaments, remarked Montague. An excellent idea, said Pantin warmly. Can it be that they are more astute than two veteran truffle hunters? They could not possibly be, my dear Montague. There was a pregnant pause. Monsieur Montague broke the silence. In the heat of the chase, he said, one does things and says things one afterwards regrets. Yes, that is true. In his excitement, one might even so far forget himself as to call a fellow sportsman, a really excellent fellow, a puffball. That is true, one might. Suddenly, Monsieur Bontecue thrust his fat hand toward Monsieur Pantin. You are not a puffball, Armand, he said. You never were a puffball. Tears leaped to the little man's eyes. He seized the extended hand in both of his and pressed it. Aristide was all he could say. Aristide. We shall drink, cried Bontecue, to the art of truffle hunting. The science, corrected Pantin gently. To the art science of truffle hunting, cried Bontecue, raising his glass. The moon smiled down on Perigord. On the ancient twisted streets of Montpont, it smiled with particular brightness. Down the rue Victor Hugo, in the middle of the street, went two men, a very stout big man and a very thin little man, arm in arm, and singing for all Montpont and all the world to hear a snatch of an old song from some forgotten review. Oh, Gabby, darling Gabby, bam, 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 why don't you come to me, bam, 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 and jump in the arms of your own true love while the wind blows chilly and cold, bam, bam, bam. End of Honor Among Sportsmen by Richard Cannell.